This episode of Reason Africa was made possible by our fans on Patreon. If you would like to gain early access to these videos, kindly support us on patreon.com slash Reason Africa. That's patreon.com slash Reason Africa. No greater evil has befallen Africa and its people with longer lasting consequences than the infamous Berlin Conference of 1884 to 1885. Apart from slavery, there's no single event in modern African history whose ramifications would echo across the years and be felt until today. The main dominating powers of the conference were France, Germany, Great Britain and Portugal, who controlled most of colonial Africa at the time. It was no accident that there were no Africans at the table. Their opinions were not considered necessary, despite rhetoric emphasizing the benefit to Africa. The efforts of the Sultan of Zanzibar to get himself invited to the party were promptly laughed off by the British. I don't know about you, but I've always been confused how King Leopold II of Belgium was able to win rights to the Congo. Even though his country had never been a great imperial power like some of his neighbors, Belgium wanted the same thing from the Berlin Conference as every European power, land, resources, and strategically valuable territories. The vast Congo Basin would be a dual possession as it ticked all the boxes here. All of the other countries wanted a peace or all of it outright. The colonial powers couldn't agree who should get the sizable Congo and violent conflict was becoming more and more likely. Among the rules of the conference, no nation was to stake claims to territory without notifying other powers of its intentions. But, as with many political engagements, the competitors ignored the rules when convenient, and on several occasions, war was only narrowly avoided. In the hotly contested scramble for colonies, 13 European nations were in attendance, including the United States. And while Belgium had a comparatively tiny economy and a weaker standing army, let's peel back the curtain and take a look at the intrigues of the behind-the-scenes events that won Leopold, not Belgium, but Leopold, what was one of, if not the most prized possession in Africa. According to archives from the Belgium Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade, King Leopold II was more imperialistic than anyone ever thought. He had interest in occupying and colonizing all of these territories, including some in the United States of America. A king who felt inadequate in many things, Leopold could not live with the fact that Belgium had no colonies like its more powerful neighbors. He strongly believed that a nation could not make its mark in history without having colonies. Therefore, he spent a great deal of his time worrying about how to acquire colonies anywhere he thought would do him fine. But he was not so lucky. Everywhere he turned, he either failed or was thwarted by other more established imperial powers. There was no more unclaimed territory in the Americas, nor were there blank spaces in Asia. The Russian Empire stretched all the way to the Pacific. The French had taken Indochina, the Dutch, the East Indies, and most of the rest of Southern Asia, from Aden to Singapore, was colored with British flags. His last hope was to turn to Africa. Only in Africa could Leopold hope to achieve his dream of seizing a colony, especially one immensely larger than tiny Belgium. His eyes were set on the Congo, which was largely unexplored in the mid-19th century and was mostly unclaimed by European countries. Leopold's intentions to own a colony would be fulfilled through a journalist named Henry Morton Stanley. Stanley had made a name for himself when he had been sent on assignment in Africa to find an explorer, David Livingstone, who had not been heard of for five years since leaving British shores. In 1871, Stanley found Livingstone and uttered what became his famous signature quotation, Dr. Livingstone, I presume? 
His superstar status as an accomplished explorer caught the eye of King Leopold, who immediately recruited him to survey the Congo. He signed a myriad of treaties with over 500 local kings who of course did not have an idea what they were signing and it is reported they only received handkerchiefs, yards of cloth, sweets and ornaments in return for acceptance of Leopold's flag. It's no wonder Stanley's exploration of the Congo River Basin increased European interest in Africa dramatically as it removed the last bit of unknown territory in the minds of the Europeans. It was therefore no surprise that the Congo Basin became a source of conflict among three principal parties, Leopold, France and Portugal. French opposition was in the form of an Italian French explorer, Pierre de Brazza, who had been employed by the French government to go on an expedition up the Ogowe River in the vicinity of the Congo Basin in what is now the country of Gabon. He had succeeded in concluding a series of treaties with King Makoko of the Teke people. The treaties, Written as usual in a language the African king could neither read nor understand, ceded huge tracts of land to De Brazza as a representative of France years later in 1882, after having lost control of Egypt to Britain in what became known as the Egypt Crisis. The French government, under pressure at home, suddenly remembered that there was a vast territory at its beck and call in Central Africa thanks to De Brazza's deceptive treaties with King Makoko. It so happened that part of that territory had been claimed by Stanley for King Leopold, and the race was on for who would be the eventual owner. While this tug of war was going on, the Portuguese also knew that they had been the first Europeans to enter the territory in 1482. In fact, when they first arrived in Congo, the Portuguese came upon a thriving African kingdom called the Congo Kingdom. Despite the contempt for Congo culture, the Portuguese grudgingly recognized in the kingdom a sophisticated and well-developed state, the leading one on the west coast of Central Africa. It was an imperial federation of 2 to 3 million people, covering an area of roughly 78,000 square miles. With multiple claims over the same territories in the Congo Basin, King Leopold quickly dispatched his accomplice, Jane Sanford, to Washington to woo the Americans to his side. On 22nd April 1884, Leopold's diplomatic emissary in America bore fruit when the Secretary of State Frederick Theodore declared that America recognized Leopold's claim to the Congo, becoming the first country to do so. This came as an absolute shock to the French, but they were not yet prepared to roll over for Leopold. They arbitrarily drew their own boundaries on a map, and they included most of the Congo River Basin. Staring defeat in the face, Leopold turned his attention to the German Chancellor Otto von Bismarck for support. But Bismarck proved difficult. He described Leopold's claim variously as a swindle and fantasies. All was not going well in Berlin for Leopold. He had thought to himself that if he was to be open and direct with his plans to conquer the Congo, it would certainly upset both the Belgian people and the major powers of Europe. If he was to seize anything in Africa, he could only do so if he convinced everyone that his interest was purely philanthropic. So in September 1876, in a bid to have his operations legitimized, he organized a conference in Brussels, attended by 13 Belgians and 24 other eminent Europeans, including famous explorers, geographers, business executives, anti-slavery activists and military men who enthusiastically endorsed his Congo adventure and agreed to establish the International African Association in support of it, with Leopold elected as its first chairman. 
He pledged to suppress the East African slave trade, guaranteed other European powers free trade with the Congo colony, and promised to promote humanitarian policies. All of these later turned out to be a bag of tricks to justify Leopold's ambitions in the Congo. In 1884, just a few months before the Berlin Conference, Leopold had Otto von Bismarck family in his camp. According to various accounts, Bismarck let himself be convinced that it was better for the Congo to go to the king of weak little Belgium and be open to German traders than to go to protectionist France or Portugal or to powerful England. In return for guarantees of freedom of trade in the Congo, Bismarck agreed to back Leopold's claim. With America and Bismarck in the bag, Leopold still had the French and Portuguese to contend with. Luckily for him, Great Britain was not interested in the Congo Basin, even though Scottish explorer Vani Cameron had explored the Congo Basin for the Brits way before Stanley. In fact, Stanley really wanted Britain, not Leopold, to colonize the Congo. But London, then going through a stiff economic recession at home and with lots of other colonies and protectorates around the world, was just not interested in a new one whose main transportation route was not entirely navigable due to cataracts. That left King Leopold some breathing space to deal with the challenge from Portugal and France. But bad news finally hit on 26th February 1884 when Portugal managed to get Britain to sign a treaty to block off Leopold's access to the Atlantic. At the time, the thirst for African land had become so intense in Europe. To resolve the conflicting claims still outstanding and to set some ground rules for the sharing of the remaining African territories, Portugal approached Otto von Bismarck to host a diplomatic conference in Berlin to peacefully discuss the different claims to the Congo. To Leopold, the Berlin conference was heaven sent. When the conference opened on 15th November 1884, 14 countries were represented by ambassadors and envoys. After three months of negotiations, France was given 670,000 square kilometers on the north bank of the Congo River, which became modern-day Congo Brazzaville and the Central African Republic. Portugal got 910,000 square kilometers to the south of the river, which became modern-day Angola, with Cabinda thrown into the mix. Leopold, meanwhile, got the lion's share, a whopping 2.4 million square kilometers right from the Atlantic Ocean to the very heart of Africa's interior, encompassing the whole 4,800 kilometer length of the Congo River and its many tributaries. It didn't end there. Leopold somehow managed to convince the conference not to transfer the Congo to one of his many philanthropic organizations, nor even to his capacity as king of the Belgians, but simply to himself. He became sole ruler of a population estimated at 30 million people, without constitution, without international supervision, without ever having been to the Congo himself, and without more than a handful of his new subjects having even heard of him. At last, Leopold got himself a colony, and it was 80 times the size of Belgium. At 2.4 million square kilometers, it was as large as Britain, France, Belgium, Ireland, Netherlands, Denmark, Portugal, Switzerland, Germany, Spain, Italy, Armenia, and Albania combined. That is how large today's Democratic Republic of Congo is. Unfortunately, Colonial accounts typically emphasized Leopold's modernizing changes in the Congo and not the mass murder he facilitated. His administration of the Congo Free State was characterized by atrocities including torture and murder resulting from notorious and systematic brutality. That's a wrap guys, if you'd like to get a better understanding of Africa, start now by subscribing and you'll be on your way. Thank you so much for watching, I'll see you next time.